Are you ready? Is that working? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our channel after months. Yeah, months and years and decades. Oh, it's been nearly two months. Oof. Okay. Chapter four. The Leaky Cauldron. It took Harry several days to get used to his strange new freedom. Never before had he been able to get up whenever he wanted, or eat whatever he fancied. He could even go wherever he liked, as long as it was in Diagon Alley, and as this long cobbled street was packed with the most fascinating wizarding shops in the world, Harry felt no desire to break his word to Fudge and stray back into the muggle world. Harry ate breakfast each morning in the leaky cauldron, where he liked watching the other guests, Funny little witches from the country, up for a day's shopping, venerable-looking wizards arguing over the latest article in Transfiguration today, wild-looking warlocks, raucous dwarfs, and once what looked suspiciously like a hag who had ordered a plate of raw liver from behind a thick woolen balaclava. After breakfast, Harry would go out into the backyard, take out his wand, tap the third brick from the left above the dustbin, and stand back as the archway into Diagon Alley opened in the wall. Harry spent the long sunny days exploring the shops and eating under the brightly coloured umbrellas outside cafes, where his fellow diners were each showing their purchases. It's a lunoscope, old boy. No more messing around with moon charts, see? Or else discussing the case of Sirius Black. Personally, I won't let any of the children out alone until he's back in Azkaban. Sorry. Harry didn't have to do his homework under the blankets by torchlight anymore. Now he could sit in the bright sunshine outside Florian Fortescue's ice cream parlour, finishing all his essays with occasional help from Florian Fortescue himself, who, apart from knowing a great deal about medieval witch burnings, gave Harry free Sundays every half hour. Whoa. A free Sunday every half hour? How many Sundays is he eating? Must be getting pretty fat. Once Harry had refilled his money bag with gold galleons, silver sickles and bronze nuts from his vault at Gringotts, he needed to exercise a lot of self-control not to spend the whole lot at once. He had to keep reminding himself that he had five years to go at Hogwarts and how it would feel to ask the Dursleys for money for spell books. To stop himself buying a handsome set of solid gold gobstones, a wizarding game rather like marbles, in which the stones squirted a nasty-smelling liquid into the other player's face when they lost a point, he was sorely tempted to, by the perfect moving model of the galaxy in a large glass ball, which would have meant he never had to take another astronomy lesson. But the thing that tested Harry's resolution most appeared in his favourite shop, Quality Quidditch Supplies, a week after he'd arrived at the Leaky Cauldron. Curious to know what the crowd in the shop was staring at, Harry edged his way inside and squeezed in amongst the excited witches and wizards until he glimpsed a newly erected podium on which was mounted the most magnificent broom he had ever seen in his life. Just come out. Prototype. A square-jawed wizard was telling his companion. It's the fastest broom in the world, isn't it, Dad? Squeaked a boy younger than Harry, who was swinging off his father's arm. Irish international size just put in an order for seven of these beauties the proprietor of the shop told the crowd, and their favourites for the World Cup. You know the next book? The Quidditch World Cup? Yeah. That's Ireland? Yeah. Yeah. They win. Probably because of the brooms. Yeah. A large witch in front of Harry moved, and he was able to read the sign next to the broom. The Firebolt. This state-of-the-art racing broom sports a streamlined, super-fine handle of ash, treated with a diamond-hard polish, and hand-numbered with its own registration. Each individually selected birch twig in the broom tail has been honed to aerodynamic perfection, giving the firebolt unsurpassable balance and pinpoint precision. The firebolt has an acceleration of 0 to 150 miles an hour in 10 seconds and incorporates an unbreakable braking charm. Price on request. Price on request. Harry didn't like to think how much the firebolt would cost. He had never wanted anything so much in his whole life, but he had never lost a Quidditch match on his Nimbus 2000, and what was the point in emptying his Gringotts vault for the firebolt? 
When he had a very good broom already, Harry didn't ask for the price, but he returned almost every day after that just to look at the fire bowl. There were, however, things that Harry needed to buy. He went to the apothecary to replenish his store of potions ingredients, and as his school robes were now several inches too short in the arm and leg, he visited Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions, and bought new ones. Most important of all, he had to buy his new school books, which would include those for his two new subjects, Care of Magical Creatures and Divination. Harry got a surprise as he looked in at the bookshop window. Instead of the usual display of gold embossed spell books the size of paving slabs, there was a large iron cage behind the glass which held about a hundred copies of The Monster Book of Monsters. Torn pages were flying everywhere as the books grappled with each other, locked together in furious wrestling matches and snapping aggressively. Harry pulled his book list out of his pocket and consulted it for the first time. The Monster Book of Monsters was listed as the set book for care of magical creatures. Now Harry understood why Hagrid had said it would come in useful. He felt relieved. <coughs> Sorry. That's right. He had been wondering whether Hagrid wanted help with some terrifying new pet. As Harry entered Flourish and Blots, the manager came hurrying towards him. Hogwarts? He said abruptly. Come to get your new books? Yes, said Harry. I need... Get out of the way, said the manager impatiently, brushing Harry aside. He drew on a pair of very thick gloves, picked up a large, knobbly walking stick, and proceeded towards the door of the monster book's cage. Hang on, said Harry quickly. I've already got one of those. Have you? A look of enormous relief spread over the manager's face. Thank heavens for that. I've been bitten five times already this morning. A loud ripping noise rent the air. Two of the monster books had seized a third and were pulling it apart. Stop it! Stop it! cried the manager, poking the walking stick through the bars and knocking the books apart. Oh, I'm never stocking them again. Never. It's been bedlam. I thought we'd seen the worst when we bought 200 copies of the Invisible Book of Invisibility. It cost a fortune and we never found them. Well, is there anything else I can help you with? Yes, said Harry, looking down his book list. I need The Unfogging the Future by Cassandra Vlablaski. Ah, uh, starting divination, are you? said the manager, stripping off his gloves and leading Harry into the back of the bookshop, where there was a corner devoted to fortune-telling. A small table was stacked with volumes such as Predicting the Unpredictable, Insulate Yourself Against Shocks and Broken Balls, When Fortunes Turn Foul. Here you are, said the manager, who had climbed a set of steps to take down a thick black-bound book, Unfogging the Future. Very good guide to all your basic fortune-telling methods. Palmistry, crystal balls, bird entrails. But Harry wasn't listening. His eyes had fallen on another book, which was among a display on a small table. Death omens. What to do when you know the worst is coming. Oh, I wouldn't read that if I were you, said the assistant lightly, looking to see what Harry was staring at. You'll start seeing death omens everywhere. It's enough to frighten anyone to death. But Harry continued to stare at the front cover of the book. It showed a black dog, large as a bear, with gleaming eyes. It looked oddly familiar. The assistant pressed, unfogging the future into Harry's hands. Anything else? he said. Ah, uh, yes, said Harry, tearing, tearing his eyes away from the dogs and dazedly consulting his book list. Uh, I need Intermediate Transfiguration and the Standard Book of Spells, Grade 3. Harry emerged from Flourish and Blots ten minutes later, with his new books under his arms, and made his way back to the leaky cauldron, hardly noticing where he was going and bumping into several people. He tramped up the stairs to his room, went inside, and tipped his books onto his bed. Somebody had been into tidy. The windows were open, and sun was pouring inside. Harry could hear the buses rolling by in the unseen muggle street behind them, and the sound of the invisible crowd below in Diagon Alley. He caught, himself, he caught sight of himself in the mirror over the basin. I can't have been a death omen, he told his reflection defiantly. I was panicking when I saw that thing in Magnolia Crescent. It was probably just a stray dog. He raised his hand automatically and tried to make his hair lie flat. You're fighting a losing battle there, dear, said his mirror in a wheezy voice. As the days slipped by, Harry started looking wherever he went for a sign of Ron or Hermione. Plenty of Hogwarts students were arriving at Diagon Alley now, with the start of term so near. Harry met Seamus Finnegan and Dean Thomas, his fellow Gryffindors in quality Quidditch supplies, where they too were ogling the fireball. 
He also ran into the real into the real Neville Longbottom. He also ran into the real Neville Longbottom. The real Neville Longbottom? Is there a fake one? Is there a fake Neville Longbottom? He also ran into the real Neville Longbottom. A round-faced forgetful boy outside Flourish and Blots. Harry didn't stop to chat. Neville appeared to have mislaid his book list and was being told off by his formidable-looking grandmother. Harry hoped she never found out that he'd pretended to be Neville. Ah. Uh, that he'd pretended to be Neville while on the run from the Ministry of oh. Magic. Yeah, that was on the bus. There we go. It's because it's been so long since we last read, we forgot that in the very last chapter we just read, he was pretending to be Neville. Yeah. Yeah. Whoops. How can you forget? It's been nearly two months. I don't know. You don't know everything, though, about this book. Well, I remember now. Yeah. Harry woke on the last day of the holidays, thinking that he would at least meet Ron and Hermione tomorrow on the Hogwarts Express. He got up, dressed, went for a last look at the firebolt, and was just wondering where he'd have lunch, when someone yelled his name and he turned. Harry! Harry! They were there, both of them, sitting outside Florian Fortescue's ice cream parlour, Ron looking incredibly freckly. Hermione was brown, both waving frantically <coughs> at him. <coughs> okay. <coughs> Finally, said Ron, grinning at Harry as he sat down. We went to the Leaky Cauldron, but they said you'd left. And we went to Flourish and Blots and Madame Malcolm's and... I got all my school stuff last week, Harry explained. And how come you know I'm staying at the Leaky Cauldron? Dad, said Ron simply. Mr Weasley, who worked at the Ministry of Magic, would of course have heard the whole story of what had happened to Aunt Marge. Did you really blow up your aunt, Harry? said Hermione in a very serious voice. I didn't mean to, said Harry, while Ron roared with laughter. I just lost control. It's not funny, Ron, said Hermione sharply. Honestly, I'm amazed Harry wasn't expelled. So am I, admitted Harry. Forget expelled? I thought I was going to be arrested. He looked at Ron. Your dad doesn't know why Fudge let me off, does he? Probably because it's you, isn't it? Shrugged Ron, still chuckling. Famous Harry Potter and all that. I'd hate to see what the Ministry do to me if I blow up an aunt. Mind you, you'd have to dig me up first, because Mum would have killed me. Anyway, you can ask Dad yourself this evening. We're staying at the Leaky Cauldron tonight. So you can come to King's Cross with us tomorrow. Hermione's there as well. Hermione nodded, beaming. Mum and Dad dropped me off this morning with all my Hogwarts things. Excellent, said Harry happily. So have you got all your new books and stuff? Look at this, said Ron, pulling a long, thin box out of out of a bag and opening it. Brand new wand. Fourteen inches, willow, containing one unicorn hair. Fourteen inches. It's a really big wand. That might be one of the biggest wands in the whole book, I think. Other than Hagrid's, which is like 18 or something. Something ridiculous. That's a long wand. And because he's still like a little kid. He doesn't have it. That's... I was about to say, that's a, that's a big one. Okay. Lost my place now. I got excited about the size of that wand. <laughs> Willow containing one unicorn hair. We'll look that up at the end of the chapter and see what that means. Because the last one sucked for him. Yeah. He pointed at a large bag under his chair. What about those monster books, eh? The assistant nearly cried when we said we wanted two. <laughs> What's all that, Hermione? Harry asked, pointing at not one, but three bulging bags in the chair next to her. Well... I'm taking more new subjects than you, aren't I? said Hermione. Those are my books for arithmetic, care of magical creatures, divination. So they can take more um, subjects when they're in like primary school? I mean... The first years? It's optional, I suppose. Hermione's just taken all of them. Cause... Did you guys have optional stuff in that early years? Yeah, but we could only pick like two. We had electives. We never had electives when we were kids. I mean, then we had electives in middle school. They're like 14 for years old by this point. They're 12 in first year. Yeah, but it's like some stuff that they're never going to Actually, they're learn. 11 in first year. They're 13. But the stuff that she's saying are stuff that they're never going to learn. Like the stuff that was elective for me was just like, eh. the other people don't know it. They just don't want to know it. But this is like important I mean, stuff, in, isn't it? In grade 8, you do all the electives, but you only do like that elective for one term and it's like I did like art for one term to decide if I want to do art as an elective next year I did mm. Chinese for a term and I was like well, I'm never going to need this again so I didn't do that I did media I was like this is useless but I did it anyway because it was fun 
you know, so maybe it's kind of like that, where Hermione's just kind of trying everything in one go to see if she wants to pursue it, okay. I'm assuming. I don't know. Okay. Care of magical creatures, divination, study of ancient runes, muggle studies. What are you doing muggle studies for, said Ron, rolling his eyes at Harry. You're muggle-born. Your mum and dad are muggles. You already know all about muggles. But it'll be fascinating to study them from the wizarding point of view, said Hermione earnestly. Are you planning to eat or sleep at all this year, Hermione? Asked Harry, while Ron sniggered. Hermione ignored them. I've still got ten galleons, she said, checking her purse. It's my birthday in September, and mum and dad gave me some money to get myself an early birthday present. How about a nice book, said Ron innocently. No, I don't think so. That's How about you get a nice book? No. Wrong. That's what Hermione said? No? <laughs> no, I don't think so, said Hermione composedly. Good. I really want an owl. I mean, Harry's got Hedwig, and you've got Errol. I haven't, said Ron. Errol's the family owl. All I've got is Scabbers. He pulled his pet rat out of his pocket. And I want to get him checked over, he added, placing Scabbers on the table in front of them. I don't think Egypt agreed with him. Scabbers was looking thinner than usual, and there was a... Def- definite droop to his whiskers there's a magical creature shop just over there said harry who knew diagon alley very well by now you can see if they've got anything for scabbers and hermione can get her owl i'm very considerate harry is it isn't hermione gonna get a cat maybe i can see a cat in the picture here mm. and something that looks kind of like a cat but no that's a not a cat that's like a devil that's a cat you, that's you <laughs> yep i'll get this that's, that's probably been... that's... So I'm a bat. That's you. <laughs> that is me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show. I'll take a picture because that's a good picture. <laughs> that's you. That's me. So they paid for their ice creams and crossed the street to the magical menagerie. <coughs> there wasn't much room inside. Every inch of wall was hidden by cages. It was smelly and very noisy because of the occupants of these cages were all squeaking, squawking, jabbering or hissing. I wish they showed this in the movie. Yeah, it would have been cool. A bunch of animals. They probably didn't because I think menageries are illegal now. They're like zoos, but it's like just a tiny cage and it's like Uh a room. Yeah. I don't know if they have them anymore. Pretty sure they're well legal. They have it for puppies, though. Don't they? It's kind of the same. Yeah, I guess. Okay. The witch behind the counter was already advising a wizard on the care of double-ended newts, so Harry, Ron, and Hermione waited, examining the cages. A pair of enormous purple toads sat gulping wetly and feasting on dead blowflies. Yeah. A gigantic tortoise with a jewel-encrusted shell was glittering near the window. That's what I'd get. It's a big tortoise. Yeah. Put a pillow on his shell. Poof. A little footrest. And you're like, hey. You put your feet out. Aww. Yeah, no. it's a tortoise. It's a hard shell. It won't hurt him. Gigi's my... For the... What is that? Where she'll give me these looks. She Judgmental looks like, looks. She looks like that Hi. meme. Where, you know, like, the, the guy, the old guy, standing going like... Anyway. Okay. poisonous orange snails (coughs) were oozing slowly up the side of their glass tank and a fat white rabbit kept changing into a silk top hat and back again with a loud popping noise Mm. then there were cats of every colour a noisy cage of ravens a basket of funny custard coloured furballs they were humming loudly and on the counter a vast cage of sleek black rats which were playing some sort of skipping game using their long bald tails. The double-ended newt wizard left and Ron approached the counter. It's my rat, he told the witch. He's been a bit off colour ever since I brought him back from Egypt. Bang him on the counter, said the witch. <laughs> Pulling a pair of heavy black spectacles out of her pocket. Ron lifted Scabbers out of his inside pocket and placed him next to the cage of his fellow rats, who stopped their skipping tricks and scuffled to the wire for a better look. Like nearly everything Ron owned, Scabbers the rat was second-hand. He had once belonged to Ron's brother Percy, and a bit battered, 
Next to the glossy rats in the cage, he looked especially woebegone. Hmm, said the witch, picking scabs up. How old is this rat? Don't know, said Ron. Quite old. He used to belong to my brother. What powers does he have? said the witch, examining Scabbers closely. Uh, said Ron. The truth was that Scabbers had never shown in the faintest trace of interesting powers. The witch's eyes moved from Scabbers' tattered left ear to his front paw, which had a missing toe, and tuttered loudly. He's been through the mill, this one, she said. He was like that when Percy gave him to me, said Ron defensively. An ordinary, common, or garden rat like this can't be expected to live longer than three years or so, said the witch. Now, if you were looking for something a bit more hard-wearing, you might like one of these. She indicated the black rats, who promptly started skipping again. Ron muttered, show-offs. Well, if you don't want a replacement, you can try this rat tonic, said the witch, reaching under the counter and bringing out a small red bottle. Okay, said Ron. How much? Ouch! Ron buckled on. Ron buckled as something huge and orange came soaring from the top of the highest cage, landing on his head, and then propelled itself, spitting madly at Scabbers. No, Crookshanks, no, cried the witch. But Scabbers shot from between her hands like a bar of soap, landed splay-legged on the floor, and then scarpered for the door. Scabbers, Ron shouted, harring out of the shop after him. Harry followed. It took them nearly ten minutes to find Scabbers, who had taken refuge under a waste paper bin outside quality quidditch supplies. Ron stuffed the trembling rat back into his pocket and straightened up, massaging his head. What was that? It was either a very big cat or quite a small tiger, said Harry. Where's Hermione? Probably getting her owl. They made their way back up the crowded street to the magical menagerie. As they reached it, Hermione came out, but she wasn't carrying an owl. Her arms were clamped tightly around the enormous ginger cat. You bought that monster, said Ron, his mouth hanging open. He's gorgeous, isn't he? said Hermione, glowing. That was a matter of opinion, thought Harry. The cat's (laughs) ginger fur was thick and fluffy but it was definitely a bit bow-legged, and his face looked grumpy and oddly squashed. Was it a frozen cat? Yeah. Yeah. As though it had run headlong into a brick wall. Now that Scabbers was out of sight, however, the cat was purring contentedly in Hermione's arms. Hermione, that thing nearly scalped me, said Ron. You didn't mean to, did you? Crookshank, said Hermione. And what about Scabbers, said Ron, pointing at the lump in his chest pocket. He needs rest and relaxation. How's he going to get it with that thing around? That reminds me. You forgot your rat tonic, said Hermione, slapping the small red bottle in Ron's hands. And stop worrying. Crookshanks will be sleeping in my dormitory, and Scabbers in yours. What's the problem? Poor Crookshanks. That witch said he'd been in there for ages. No one wanted him. Don't wonder why, said Ron sarcastically, as they set off towards the leaky cauldron. They found Mr Weasley sitting in the bar, reading the Daily Prophet. Harry, he said, smiling as he looked up. How are you? Fine, thanks, said Harry, as he, Ron and Hermione joined Mr. Weasley with all their shopping. Mr. Weasley put down his paper, and Harry saw the now familiar picture of Sirius Black staring up at him. They still haven't caught him, then? He asked. No, said Mr. Weasley, looking extremely grave. They've pulled us all off our regular jobs at the Ministry to try and find him, but no luck so far. Would we get a reward if we caught him? asked Ron. It'd be good to get some more money. Don't be ridiculous, Ron, said Mr. Weasley. (laughs) Don't be ridiculous. (laughs) I'm sorry, Dad. Who, on closer inspection, looked very strained. Black's not going to be caught by a 13-year-old wizard. It's like the plot of every bloody... Every single one of these Harry Potter books is like, oh, little boy's not going to do anything. End of the book. Wow, who would have thought a little boy could do that? It's the Azkaban guards who will get him back. You mark my words. At that moment, Mrs. Weasley entered the bar, laden with shopping and followed by the twins, Fred and George, who were about to start their fifth year at Hogwarts. The newly elected head boy, Percy, and the Weasley's youngest child and only girl, Ginny. Ginny, who had always been very taken with Harry, seemed even more heartily embarrassed than usual when she saw him, perhaps because he had saved her life during the last term at Hogwarts. She went very red and muttered, Hello, without looking at him. Percy, however, held out his hand solemnly, as though he and Harry had never met, and said, Harry, how nice to see you. Hello, Percy, said Harry, trying not to laugh. I hope you're well, said Percy. 
Herpy. Herpy, said Percy pompously, shaking hands. It was rather like being introduced to the mayor. Very well, thanks. Harry, said Fred, elbowing Percy out of the way and bowing deeply. Simply splendid to see you, old boy. Marvellous, said George, pushing Fred aside and seizing Harry's hand in turn. Absolutely spiffing, Percy scowled. That's enough now, said Mrs. Weasley. Mum, said Fred, as though he'd only just spotted her and seized her hand too. How really corking to see you. I said that's enough, said Mrs. Weasley, depositing her shopping in an empty chair. Hello, Harry dear. I suppose you've heard our exciting news. She pointed at the brand new silver badge on Percy's chest. Second head boy in the family, she said, swelling with pride. And last, Fred muttered under his breath. Oh. I don't doubt that, said Mrs. Weasley, frowning suddenly. I notice they haven't made you two prefects. What do we want to be prefects for, said George, looking revolted at the very idea. It'd take all the fun out of life, Ginny giggled. <laughs> you want to set a better example to your sister, snapped Mrs. Weasley. <laughs> ginny has got other brothers to set her an example, mother, said Percy loftily. I'm going up to change for dinner. He disappeared and George heaved a sigh. We tried to shut him in a pyramid, he told Harry, but Mum spotted us. Dinner that night was a very enjoyable affair. Tom, the innkeeper, put three tables together in the parlour. And the seven Weasleys, Harry and Hermione, ate their way through five delicious courses. How are we getting to King's Cross tomorrow, Dad? asked Fred, as they tucked into a sumptuous chocolate pudding. The Ministry's providing a couple of cars, said Mr. Weasley. Everyone looked up at him. Why? said Percy curiously. It's because of you, Percy, said George seriously, and there'll be little flags on the bonnet with HB on them. For humongous butthead, said Fred. Everyone except Percy and Mrs. Weasley snorted into their pudding. Why are the Ministry providing cars, Father? Asked Percy again. Fa- father? Father? father. <laughs> I've lost my place now. Why, why are the Ministry providing cars, Father? Percy asked again in a dignified voice. Well, as we haven't got one anymore, said Mr. Weasley, and as I work there, they're doing me a favour. His voice was casual, but Harry couldn't help noticing that Mr. Weasley's ears had gone red, just like Ron's did when he was under pressure. Good job too, said Mrs. Weasley briskly. Do you realise how much luggage you've all got between you? A nice sight you'd be on the Muggle Underground. You're all packed, aren't you? Ron hasn't put all his new things in his trunk yet, said Percy, in a long-suffering voice. He dumped them on my bed. You'd better go and pack properly, Ron, because we won't have much time in the morning, Mrs Weasley called down the table. Ron scowled at Percy. After dinner, everyone felt very full and sleepy. One by one, they made their way upstairs to their rooms to check their things for the next day. Ron and Percy were next door to Harry. He had just closed and locked his own trunk when he heard angry voices through the wall and went to see what was going on. The door of number 12 was ajar, and Percy was shouting, It was here, on the bedside table. I took it off for polishing. I haven't touched it all right, Ron roared back. What's up? said Harry. My head boy badge is gone, said Percy, rounding on Harry. So scab is rat tonic, said Ron, throwing things out of his trunk to look. Think I might have left it in the bar. You're not going anywhere till you've found my badge, yelled Percy. I'll get Scabber's stuff unpacked, Harry said to Ron, and he went downstairs. Harry was halfway along the passage to the bar, which was now very dark, when he heard another pair of angry voices coming from the parlour. A second later, he recognised them as Mr. and Mrs. Weasley. He hesitated, not wanting them to know he'd heard them rowing, when the sound of his own name made him stop, then moved closer to the parlour door. Makes no sense not to tell him, Mr. Weasley was saying heatedly. Harry's got a right to know. I've tried to tell Fudge, but he insists on treating Harry like a child. He's 13 years old, and Arthur, the truth would terrify him, said Mrs. Weasley shrilly. Do you really want to send Harry Harry back to school with that hanging over him? For heaven's sake, he's happy not knowing. I don't want to make him miserable. I want to put him on, on his guard, retorted Mr. Weasley. You know what Harry and Ron are like, wandering off by themselves. They've ended up in the Forbidden Forest. Harry mustn't do that this year. When I think what could have happened to him that night, he ran away from home. If the night bus hadn't picked him up, I'm prepared to bet he would have been dead before the Ministry found him. But he's not dead. He's fine. So what's the point? Molly, they say Sirius Black's mad. And maybe he is. But he was clever enough to escape from Azkaban. And that's supposed to be impossible. It's been a month now, and no one's seen 
hide nor hair of him, and I don't care what Fudge keeps telling the Daily Prophet. We're no nearer to catching Black than inventing self-spelling wands. The only thing we know for sure is that what Black's after. But Harry will be perfectly safe at Hogwarts. Yeah, because everyone's always yeah. safe at Hogwarts. Two years their stuff own, has happened their to Their own it. daughter was kidnapped yeah. into the Chamber of Secrets. And they're like, yeah, but Harry will be fine. We thought Azkaban was perfectly safe if Black can break out of Azkaban. He can break into Hogwarts. But no one's really sure that Black's after Harry. There was a thud on wood, and Harry was sure Mr. Weasley had banged his fist on the table. Molly, how many times do I have to tell you? They didn't report it in the press because Fudge wanted to keep it quiet. But Fudge went out to Azkaban the night Black escaped. The guards told Fudge that Black's been talking in his sleep for a while now. Always the same words. He's at Hogwarts. He's at Hogwarts. Black is deranged, Molly, and he wants Harry dead. If you ask me, he thinks murdering Harry will bring you-know-who back to power. Black lost everything that what night. What did they think he was um, trying to get you-know-who instead of Harry? Why did I think that? Because Voldemort's not Hogwarts. Well, he was the last two years. I mean, because he's a supporter of Voldemort. He's at Hogwarts. He's at Hogwarts. Yeah, why do you think it's definitely Harry? Maybe he's talking about someone else. Who's because he? they know that Sirius Black is a... At the moment, this is what they know. They know that Sirius Black is a supporter of Voldemort. And he's killed a lot of muggles and hmm. Peter Pettigrew. He's killed a lot of people in the name of Lord Voldemort. Okay. That's what's been reported in the press. And he wanted to kill... Uh, James and Lily Potter. Like, okay. he's there to to take out Voldemort's enemies, and who's Voldemort's biggest enemy? Harry Potter. So they're okay. just assuming... Is that right? Because who else is at Hogwarts that would mean be of any significance to him other than Harry? Okay. If you ask me, he thinks murdering Harry will bring you-know-who back to power. Black lost everything the night Harry stopped you-know-who, and he's had 12 years alone in Azkaban to brood on that. There was a silence... Harry leant still closer to the door, desperate to hear more. Well, Arthur, you must do what you think is right, but if you're getting out with Dumbledore, I don't think anything could hurt Harry at Hogwarts while Dumbledore was headmaster. Like a pig for slaughter, right? I suppose he knows all about this. Of course he knows. We do ask him if he minds the Azkaban guards stationing themselves around the entrances to the school grounds. He wasn't happy about it, but he agreed. Not happy? Why shouldn't he be happy if they're there to catch Black? Dumbledore isn't fond of the Azkaban guards, said Mr. Weasley heavily. Nor am I, if it comes to that. But when you're dealing with a wizard like Black, you sometimes have to join forces with those you'd rather avoid. If they save Harry, then I will never say another word against them, said Mr. Weasley wearily. It's late, Molly. We'd better go up. Harry heard chairs move. As quietly as he could, he hurried down the passage to the bar and out of sight. The parlour door opened, and a few seconds later, footsteps told him that Mr. and Mrs. Wheezy were climbing the stairs. The bottle of rat tonic was lying under the table they had sat at earlier. Harry waited until he heard Mr. and Mrs. Weasley's bedroom door close, then headed back upstairs with the bottle. Fred and George were crouching in the shadows on the landing, heaving with laughter as they listened to Percy dismantling his and Ron's room in the search for his badge. We've got it, Fred whispered to Harry. We've been improving it. The badge now read, Big Head Boy. Harry forced a laugh, went to give Ron the rat tonic, then shut himself in his room and lay down on his bed. So Sirius Black was after him. That explained everything. Fudge had been lenient with him because he was so relieved to find him alive. He'd made Harry promise to stay in Diagon Alley, where they were... Gigi... Uh, yeah, even Gigi's like me, and I wish those guys would shut up. She's like a little cameraman. A camera woman. Woman! Hi, beautiful. She's just sitting behind the camera. Just looking. Hey, peep, 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 peep. It's the first time we've done one of these where she hasn't freaked out and been like, what are you doing? Yeah. What's all this stuff? 
He'd made Harry promise to stay in Diagon Alley, where there were plenty of wizards to keep an eye on him, and he was sending two ministry cars to take them all to the station tomorrow so that the Weasleys could look after Harry until he was on the train. Harry lay listening to the muffled shouting next door and wondered why he didn't feel more scared. Sirius Black had murdered 13 people with one curse. Mr. and Mrs. Weasley obviously thought Harry would be panic-stricken if he knew the truth, but Harry happened to agree wholeheartedly with Mrs. Weasley that the safest place on earth was wherever our was Dumbledore happened to be. Didn't people always say that Dumbledore was the only person Lord Voldemort had ever been afraid of? Surely Black, as Voldemort's right-hand man, would be just as frightened of him. And then there was these Azkaban guards everyone kept talking about. They seemed to scare most people senseless. And if they were stationed all around the school, Black's chances of getting inside seemed very remote. No, all in all, the thing that bothered Harry most was the fact that his chances of visiting Hogsmeade now looked like zero. Nobody wanted Harry to leave the safety of the castle until Black was caught. In fact, Harry suspected his every move would be carefully watched until the danger had passed. He scowled at the dark ceiling. Do they think he couldn't look after himself? He'd escaped Lord Voldemort three times. He wasn't completely useless. Unbiden, the image of the beast in the shadows of Magnolia Crescent crossed his mind. What to do when you know the worst is coming? Well, I'm not going to be murdered, Harry said out loud. That's the spirit, dear, said his mirror sleepily. That's the chapter. Why the Dementor have the chocolate? Hmm? It was like the Dementor of chocolate. You'll have to find out. The chocolate? The They're not chocolate. That is chocolate. Yeah, but the mentors are not chocolate. You don't remember what the significance of the chocolate is? You'll find out next time we read it. Oh. Okay. Thoughts? Feelings? It was a really cutesy chapter in the beginning because of the animals. Mm. That's why it's really nice. And the three of them being cuckoo, as always. And then the big crazy family that Ron has. Yeah, I don't have anything to say, to be honest. It was a cool chapter. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. The thing you want to search, by the way. The yeah, I'll get that bit. Okay. I, uh, I liked... That Harry had like a whole week in Diagon Alley. Just like that would have been like the coolest thing ever for him. I don't think they went hard enough on the fact that this was like the first time he'd like, I know he's got Hogwarts, but like he's completely out on his own. He's got all his own money mm. and like he's really responsible. He didn't just go blow it on like a bunch of random junk and yeah. But like, no, nah, that would have been like the coolest thing ever for him. And they didn't really be like, oh, whoa, like, I'm having the best time. It's just like, hmm, looking forward to seeing my friends. Like, goodbye, crap. I know he's getting a free Sunday every half hour, but damn. Uh, what was the Are you th- telling him to go buy stuff? Yeah, like, he's a 13-year-old kid, you know? Ron <laughs> Weasley's second wand. <coughs> Willow unicorn hair. The wand seemed to suit Ron better than his first wand. Well, obviously, the first wand was, like, all these things that sucked. And it was broken. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, it didn't really work for him even before it was broken. It was really bad it was broken. Uh, Apparently, willow wand owners often have some usually unwarranted insecurity. Mm. Yeah, so Ron's got a little bit of that to do with... I don't know. To be honest, he has a lot of it. An inferiority good. complex because he thinks all his siblings are better than him. Unicorn hair wands produce consistent magic and most difficult to turn to the dark arts and are the most faithful of wands. So that's kind of wrong too. Yep, that's pretty much it. Um, I did also notice at the beginning of the chapter... When he's kind of first describing, like, his, you know, day-to-day from the Leaky Cauldron, he was like, oh, I went and did this, and I went and did that. He got to see... Where is it? 
funny little witches, venerable looking wizards, wild looking warlocks. Yeah. What's the difference between a warlock? Like a witch and a wizard. Witch is a girl, wizard's a boy, what's a warlock? They have a lot of power. Do you reckon that's it? Yeah. It probably is, to be honest. And a hag. Is a hag, like, is a hag a more powerful witch? Or is a hag an ugly witch? Yeah, that's what I thought, yeah. but, like... And they've got yeah. dwarf, like, he's throwing dwarfs in the mix. And the hag's wearing a balaclava. And it's like, <sighs> what are they trying to say? J.K. Rowling, confirmed racist. Uh, and the firebolt, price on request... What, why Why would it be price on request? Huh? The fireball. Oh, I don't know. The only reason I can think that it would be price on request would be because he'd probably have the display model up there, which like he probably doesn't sell, or at least sells last, and he'd probably got like a couple at the back. Probably doesn't sell many of these things, I'm assuming. He wouldn't have like a whole stack of them. He'd probably have like three, or maybe he orders them in, or I don't know. Um... But because, like, each broomstick, it's not, like, manufactured. Like, they're handmade, right? So they'd have to be a little bit different. Each one would be different. So I'm assuming it's price on request because the price varies and some would cost more than others. But, like, surely you'd at least put, like, a price range, you know, starting at. Or, you know, he yeah. could have at least priced the one that's on display. And then when he sells that, put another one on display. Like, it just... It yeah. seems... I'm imagining that J.K. Rowling put price on request because she didn't actually want to work out how much this thing cost. Because Harry's, like, obscenely rich, right? So how much would this thing cost for it to be out of his grasp, you know? Yeah. And she's, like, famously very bad at money. Like, a wand costs, like, ten galleons, which is, like, the most useful thing on Earth, but then it's, like, one newspaper is a galleon, and it's, like... Seriously? Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, yeah, nah, it's dumb. Yeah. Uh, I think that's it. I did like the invisible books. He goes to the bookshop and he's like, this is as bad as the invisible books. Bought invisible books. How do you read the invisible book? <laughs> uh, also in the movie, they did do that bit differently where he's got the book and his book goes like mad in the... Yeah. And it bites people, yeah. whereas Hagrid just, like, gave him one. And he's like, cool, I've got that. Also, Scabbers, one toe missing. I... Yeah, there was a fair bit of foreshadowing, actually, because they yeah. also were like, oh, the Irish, they, they're they the favourites for the next World Cup. They've ordered all these fireballs, and it's, well, that's going to happen mm. in the next book. Okay, but other than that, that's all I noticed. Okay. Done? Yep. Okay. Thank you guys for watching. See you next video. What did I do? I don't remember. I'm looking at Gigi. Careful girl. Come here, girl. I think she's eating ants. <laughs> Good girl. What is this? A house for ants?